Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar titled Multiple Sclerosis Advancing Treatment Through Imaging Biomarkers. My name is Jane Antique, Marketing Communications Manager at Ixico, and I will be your host for today's session. Uh, before we go ahead, we're going to uh, just quickly go through the agenda so I can show you what uh, we're going to be exploring. Uh, first, we're going to do um, presenter instructions, um, and then afterwards we'll go straight into a presentation by Lynn, uh, followed by Frederick, and then we'll go into the Q&A uh, that's going to be moderated by Kirsty. Um, so we're going to explore a couple of topics today in the webinar. Uh, there'll be some insights into the intricate world of the uh, MS drug development landscape, as well as the established and emerging imaging techniques for diagnostic, disease management, and clinical trial purposes. We're also going to be looking at opportunities for future developments, as well as your questions answered in the QA portion. So, without um, further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing our two presenters for today and our moderator for the QA section. So, uh, we're joined by we're joined by Lynn Hughes, senior therapeutic advisor at Ixico, who has over 35 years of experience in clinical trial uh, research um, and is a leading inter international clinical trials expert, uh, having worked at IQVIA as a VP and global head of CNS and medical strategy. Uh, she's exclusively focused on neurology and has had oversights of over 450 global trials, which include over 80 MS um, trials uh, to date. Um, and also joining us today, we have uh, Frederick Barkov, Professor of Neuroradiology at Amsterdam UNC and UN UCL. Um, his research interest focuses on multiple sclerosis, spinal cord MRI, grey matter and atrophy, um, ageing, white matter lesions and microbleeds, and dementia, structural, functional, MR and PET. Uh, he has co-authored over a thousand papers um, uh, in PubMed. PubMed um, and, uh, Finally, we are joined by our moderator, Kirsi Kinnanen, senior, senior biomarker scientist at Ixico. Um, Kirsi is uh, a chartered psychologist of over 15 years of clinical neuroscience experience, uh, and she, is focused, uh, she focuses on brain imaging CNS for clinical trials with expertise in Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinsonian syndromes, spinal cerebellar ataxia, multiple sclerosis, and traumatic brain in uh, injury. And now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Lynn for her presentation. Over to you, Lynn. OK, there are two main forms. The relapsing form, which is characterised by individual attacks with periods of remission, and the progressive forms, characterised by pro uh, gradual progression with little or no remission. Next slide, please, Jane. when it comes. Thank you. So the diagnosis of MS is still made mostly by the McDonnell criteria, and these were named after the New Zealand neurologist William Ian McDonald and put forward in 2001. He basically convened an international panel of experts along with the National MS Society of the US. And these guidelines replaced the ones we previously used, the POSA criteria, but they did maintain the POSA criteria to demonstrate dissemination of lesions in time and in space. They've since been revised in 2005, 2010 and 2017. And as you can see from this quote here, if the 2017 McDonald criteria are fulfilled and there is no better explanation for the clinical presentation, then the diagnosis is MS. This diagnosis is really a clinical diagnosis as there is not a definitive laboratory test for MS. Subjects are asked about the history of their symptoms. They undergo lab evaluations, MRI scans. They may have other assessments to exclude any other disease before making the definitive diagnosis. CSF analysis of specific IgG oligoclonal bands can lead to a more definitive diagnosis as these are present in the CSF of up to 90% of subjects with MS they may be considered the immunological hallmark that supports the MS diagnosis. Professor Barkoff will be discussing all the MRI findings. Next slide, please. Okay, we'll go ahead anyway. In terms of the causes for MS, these are not fully understood. 
but they likely involve a combination of immunological, infectious, environmental, and genetic as shown on this slide. The virus Epstein-Barr has been implicated in the etiology or the pathophysiology of MS, and there are a number of ongoing studies assessing this relationship, from looking at antivirals to adoptive cell therapy with autologous EBV specific cytotoxic C T lymphocytes. In addition, there's a number of studies looking at first degree relatives of people with MS and in identical twins. If one twin develops a disease, the other twin has a one in four risk of developing it as well. It is not a one-to-one -one risk. And there are a few studies looking to see if an increase in vitamin D3 has a positive effect on subjects with MS. Regarding the genetic link, I'm not going to go into that, but there were a couple of GWAS studies, genome-wide association studies, and they found that HLA-DR2 is the largest identified genetic risk factor for MS. Next slide, please, Jane. The global market for MS is robust. As you can see from this slide, it's estimated at more than $20 billion per year. As it is a chronic disease, subjects are on therapy for many years or for life. The numbers with the disease are estimated at around 2.8 million. This may well be an underrepresentation. Around 60,000 people are diagnosed every year with MS, and some 15 to 20,000 subjects start therapy. It's estimated that more than 1 million subjects have received interventional therapy for their MS. And that at any stage, there are more than 300,000 subjects globally currently receiving therapy. Of these, a good number of them, some 60,000 subjects or so per year, do change therapy, either due to intolerable side effects or to see if they can obtain further benefit from a change in therapy. And there are actually a number of switch trials. Most of these are in phase four. Next slide, please. This slide shows some of the drugs on the global market for the treatment of MS, not all of them. For many years, the only drugs we had available to treat MS were the interferons and capaxone. And I remember running a study in the early 1990s with high and low dose Avonex, that's interferon one alpha. We needed to recruit 800 subjects and this was done in a matter of months. The drug was on the market at the time, but very expensive and too expensive for many health authorities. So subjects and patients jumped at the opportunity to participate in this active comparator control study. During the 90s and 2000s, there was a lot of investment into MS. And there was an explosion of new drugs hitting the global market, starting with Tisabri in around 2004, and most recently with Ponvori. Onesimod, approved in 2021. Symptomatic drugs such as Sativex and Baclofen for spasticity are not on this timeline. So while these newly approved drugs are fantastic for patients, they may have a cho choice in their treatment, and if they don't respond well to one therapy, they do have the opportunity to change treatments. But they are a challenge to the pharma companies and the biotechs who are still developing new and different drugs to treat or manage MS and who usually need large numbers of subjects to satisfy both regulatory and statistical requirements. Next slide please. So what does the global clinical trials arena look like at the moment? If you do a quick search on something like ms uh, clintrials.gov you'll find more than 3,000 studies listed. These include expanded access studies, registries, therapeutic trials, trials looking at diet, exercise, yoga, completed and terminated trials. If you narrow this search down and just look at interventional and industry sponsored trials, you'll still find more than 900 trials listed. And if you further refine this search to industry sponsored, interventional and active and ongoing, you'll find more than 100 phase one to four studies that are shown the distribution that's on this bar chart here. This is quite a significant number.
and some of these trials require a lot of subjects for the protocol and the statistical analyses. Phase 3 trials can often recruit more than 1,000 subjects and need more than 200 clinical trial sites. In Phase 3 at the moment of those 53 trials, there are more than a dozen trials that are seeking to recruit between 800 and 2,000 subjects and who are planning on utilising between 60 and 300 global clinical trial sites. The total patient burden just for Phase 3 is between 45 and 50,000 subjects. And these trials are oftentimes complex. They require many MRIs. They have lengthy treatment periods with lots of assessments. And as such, they can run into a lot of money. Some trials cost more than a billion dollars just to run one study. And in addition, due to the competition, companies are having to extend their geographical footprint and extend into new and emerging markets and trial arenas, which present a different set of challenges. For some early phase studies, phase 1A to 2, some companies are still looking at placebo controlled studies, and these are becoming increasingly difficult as ethics committees, IRBs, countries, sites and subjects are unwilling to participate in such studies. Maybe a short time placebo controlled study of 12 weeks with a placebo and an active comparator, with the active comparator being offered to subjects on dropout or relapse might be acceptable to ethics committee sites and subjects, but recruitment will still be slow and challenging. A recent white paper from Quintiles summarised their last 76 completed MS studies. And they found that in summary, recruitment rates have been decreasing since 2012. They found that subjects do not like a long washout period before entering a clinical trial. And this has contributed to the decrease seen in recruitment rates. They found there are an increasing number of drugs in late phase and an increase in the number of trials in late phase. And there was a significant shifting of recruitment from our traditional regions of West Europe, Scandinavia, North America and Canada to new geographies. And there was a significant decrease in the acceptance of placebo controlled trials and the use of interferons. But on the upside, reflecting the importance of this disease and the treatments available, last year in July, the World Health Organization had added three new drugs to its global model list of essential medication, namely cladribine, glatamine acetate and rituximab. These are the only three MS drugs on this global model list. And the list contains the medications considered by the WHO to be the most effective and safe to meet the most important needs in a healthcare system. More than 155 countries have already created national lists of essential medications based on this WHO list. And we also had the first biosimilar to Tisabri approved last August. And this product is now available in some of the states in the United States. Last slide, please. So in summary, the MS clinical trial arena is very active, very crowded and competitive. The large three phase three trials are dominated by the big boys of pharma mentioned here, Muxerono, Biogen, Roche, Novartis, Celgene, maybe in part based on the costs of running these huge studies. Of interest, there are a few trials now in early phase looking at gene and cell therapy. And depending on the outcome of these, maybe this arena will grow in the future. Companies and drug developers have the challenges of entering into new geographies, such as the ones listed here, where clinical trial experience is more limited and therefore more support and training may be needed to, to ensure quality and invaluable subjects. But MS still remains a disease where the symptoms are not fully addressed. And thus there is an unmet medical need when it comes to disability and cognitive decline. And therefore there's still a lot of opportunity for further and targeted research. Thank you for your attention. And Jane A, I hand it back to you now. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, that was really insightful. And I think, I hope that everybody else got a really good understanding of what was inside, uh, like 
the landscape itself and the opportunity that that uh, is about for uh, developers and researchers and to understanding the disease. So um, I hope that's given you clarity. Um, and then the next presenter, um, Frederick, I'm just going to pass over the permissions now for slides. Um, and then um, in the meanwhile, if you do have any questions uh, for Lynn or for Frederick, um, please do drop them into the questions box uh, on your GoToWebinar panel. Um, and without further ado, uh, Frederick, uh, I'm going to pass the presentation over to you. Uh, and before that, I'll just make sure that I can confirm that we can all see your slides. I can see your slides. Great. Um, I'll pass it over to you then, Frederick. Uh, Frederick, if you can unmute yourself as well. <laughs> yeah, I was just asking whether you could hear me. <laughs> Clearly, yeah, yeah, we can hear you loud and clear now. All right, yeah, yeah. The problem is once you go into presentation mode, you don't see the... Uh... So welcome, Class. everybody, and uh, thanks, uh, Janie, and and, and uh, others at Exico uh, for inviting me to, to speak at this webinar, which is a topic very, uh, very close to my heart. Um, I've been dealing with uh, um, MS research and the applications of MRI for, for the last couple of decades. Uh, and today I've been asked to talk about um, ex established, but also some emerging MRI techniques that we can use for, for diagnosis, disease management, and clinical trials. These are my disclosures. I work uh, with various pharma companies, both in the MS and in the Alzheimer field, and I'm in various um, DSMB, uh, DSMBs and steering committees and also consulting to various companies regarding um, design of studies, outcome measures, interpretation of trial results, but also uh, safety readings. Um, and yeah, if we look at, at the diagnostic part, and Lynn already uh, alluded to that, there's the uh, McDonald criteria um, that have been formula reformulated lastly in 2017. Here's a slide from the publication that occurred just early 2018, um, showing which areas of the CNS are most commonly involved in MS, which includes lesions around the ventricles. That's the, uh, the most typical finding, I guess, lesions around the ventricles, so periventricular lesions, often with this ovoid shape, as we will see in a minute as well. But then uh, also lesions infraterritorially, which may mean in the brainstem or in the cerebellum. Let me just change this to a laser pointer. So in the cerebellum or in the brainstem are typical locations, uh, but then also in the spinal cord, because there are multiple short segment lesions that are typical of MS. Whereas, for example, in, in MOGAD or NMOSD, you would expect more elongated lesions. Um, and, and this is very useful for diagnostic purposes because with aging, we may accumulate some white spots in the brain, especially if we smoke or have hypertension, whereas in the spinal cord, you don't see these incidental lesions. So it's very useful for uh, the diagnosis and the differential diagnosis of MS, but also prognostically is very important. And then finally, you can have lesions that are either in the cortex, so intracortical or juxtacortical. And actually, the juxtacortical are more common, so those are lesions that follow the U fibers just below the cortex. Um, a very typical of MS, and you wouldn't see them in patients, for example, with small vessel disease. And to make a diagnosis of MS, you need somebody with a typical clinically isolated syndrome. You need to have lesions in at least two locations. And probably uh, later this year or early next year, you will read the, the, in the revisions of the McDonald criteria that there will be a fifth location, which is the optic nerve, uh, as one to choose from. Um, and then obviously exclude any other possible cause for demyelination. The other thing that we need to establish is dissemination in time, which we can do by virtue of gadolinium enhancement. Here you see a T1 with gadolinium on the, on the right side, is a T2-weighted image. And on the TT, we see multiple lesions, some of which are periventricular. Uh, and then uh, this one is being enhanced. The contrast uh, enhancement occurs. So we see this bright signal on the T1, also in this lesion, whereas multiple other lesions are not so. It means that some are older, some are new and active. And the gadolinium enhancement shows us the dissemination in time, but it also shows us the disease activity uh, because we see the blood brain barrier disruption because there's active inflammation which is a feature that you see in early uh, in new MS lesions and lasts for 
about two to three weeks and then subsides and it subsides more quickly if you give steroids um, or, or other treatments will suppress the amount of gadolinium enhancement or, or new lesions overall. Uh, but it's a relatively short-lived phenomenon, so we know that this is a marker of disease activity. It shows us the dissemination of time, but later on we can use this for monitoring purposes as well. Um, so the, the appropriate use of MRI in patients with MS is explained in, in detail in this paper, which is the, uh, the, the Magnum's, uh, most recent Magnum's guidelines where we collaborated with the NIMES, which is a North American study group, and the Center for MS, uh, Consortium for MS Centers, also a North American group, um, which, which explains what protocol to use, uh, when to use it, and uh, timing of scans, and, and some safety considerations as well. So one thing is, is to get a, a diagnosis in a patient. The other thing is to save something about the prognosis of, of a patient and risk stratification and, and to whether or not to, to treat early on and, uh, and who's at risk of developing disability. Because as Lynn said, uh, a fraction of people will develop secondary progressive MS and th that is what you really would like to avoid people getting into a wheelchair. Um, and, and therefore, you know, it's not just the diagnosis, but we need to also uh, look at unfavorable MRI characteristics. So um, once you have established the diagnosis of MS, then the next question is, should we treat it? Uh, and um, I think many drugs have now been labeled to be used in CAS already to when you can make uh, a very early diagnosis uh, and basically prevent further damage. Uh, and it's especially effective in, in people with large number of lesions and people with a lot of gadolinium enhancing lesions. You can imagine that if you have only two lesions and you barely fulfill the criteria, uh, that, that, that patients may want to wait and say, well, you know, uh, let's wait what happens. Perhaps I don't have very aggressive disease, whereas in people with lots of lesions and, and lots of gadolinium enhancement, there's a much more urgent need to, to treat and perhaps even skip first line treatment and immediately go to high efficacy drugs uh, and not waste time. And then in, in addition, there are some unfavorable MRI characteristics. As I already mentioned, if you have multiple spinal cord lesions, that's not a good sign. Uh, even if they are not clinically manifest at the moment, this will lead to problems in the future. So people with spinal cord lesions are much more likely to develop disability and become secondary progressive. Same thing is true for people with infratentorial lesions, people who develop T1 hyperintense lesions, so-called black holes, and people who early on develop atrophy either in the brain or the spinal cord, and I'll come back to these uh, imaging features later on. Here's an example of, of patients, three different patients. Uh, you can see that this patient only has one lesion uh, uh, in a typical location, just anterior of the fourth ventricle, but otherwise normal appearance of the brainstem and, and the cerebellum. And then here's a patient with multiple lesions, uh, typical MS locations, uh, a bit of atrophy probably as well, and then here's another patient with extensive confluent lesions and massive cerebellar atrophy, uh, which of course is a very unfavorable uh, disposition. Likewise, in the brain, uh, there are features that are unfavorable. This is a very nice slide uh, from uh, that Alex Rovier put together, and it's in one of our review papers, where a patient was followed on the same scan uh, over uh, a decade. Um, not easy to get somebody back on the same scanner over there, okay, so it's a very beautiful illustration. And you can see initially the patient has a limited number of lesions, actually is an active lesion which seems to sort of get a bit smaller. And then um, five years later you can see there's quite a bit of accumulation of, of lesion load. And then you might naively think that it sort of stabilizes. Uh, there are not that many new lesions, but if we now look at the T1, we can see that lots of lesions have become very dark on the T1, the so-called black holes, and that these black holes enlarge. And we'll talk later about slowly evolving lesions, uh, but here you can see it happening. Existing lesions that slowly keep growing, and alongside you see dilatation of the ventricular system occurring, but also widening of sulcer at the convexity as signs of neurodegeneration and, and atrophy occurring. So how can we use MRI in clinical trials? Well, there, there are multiple ways in which you can do it. Obviously, you can use it uh, to, to define inclusion criteria, for example, in, in CIS studies or enrichment, uh, if you wanna have, for example, only patients with active disease or you wanna have uh, 
patients, you know, uh, with, let's say, uh, uh, chronic active lesions, you may want to apply a, a, a screening uh, regimen. Um, then I think most importantly is, is in phase two. And uh, many anti-inflammatory uh, drugs that are on the market now have been selected based on, on MRI outcomes in phase two, where it's often uh, the primary endpoint to determine whether a drug has any effect in, in reducing the frequency of new lesions uh, developing. But progressively also in trials that probe uh, more neuroprotection and, uh, and preservation of brain atrophy, for example, by looking at atrophy. Then many phase three trials um, will use a clinical outcome because that is required by the regulations for, for registration. Nevertheless, it's good to have um, an MRI outcome alongside as, as a confirmatory endpoint uh, will have much more higher power than uh, the primary outcomes. So will allow you to uh, look at subgroups, for example, or, or let's say, for example, older and younger patients or patients with a different ancestry. Uh, so it'll give you a more granular view on the data and just uh, reinforce the, uh, the clinical findings. And alongside, you may also want to look at safety to make sure there are no side effects. For example, PML is something that has been observed, but also other side effects that may occur on imaging. Uh, and then there are some emerging markers that I will discuss in the last part of my talk, especially the uh, slowly evolving lesions, but also magnetization transfer ratio to look at uh, repair mechanisms and remyelination. So let me give you an example of, of a patient that we studied who was not on treatment um, and had, had monthly scans. And these are T1s with gadolinium. And you can see at baseline there were two enhancing lesions. And then a month later, there were two new enhancing lesions. And then a month later, this lesion probably was growing. And sometimes you see that a sort of centrifugal pattern occurs of growth. And then multiple new lesions occurred, and then this lesion became smaller, disappeared, but then other new lesions occurred. So you can see a very dynamic picture. This is not the most typical uh, patient, of course, it's very active, but it just gives you a feeling of how dynamic the disease can be. And I think on average, it's fair to say that if you do monthly assessments, you will see about 10 times more disease activity on MRI compared with clinical. Um, so a patient may have on average one relapse a year, and may on average have one active lesion per month almost. So as I said, this is a very good readout uh, over a very short period for to see where the drugs, drugs are active. Uh, and here's uh, an example, just an example from, from the Fingolimod uh, program in the, in the phase two where gadolinium was used uh, as a primary readout. Uh, this was a placebo controlled trial. And you can see that the placebo patients they just, if, if you look at active lesions, they just keep accumulating active lesions over time. So if you look at the cumulative number of active lesions, it's a nice straight line. And you can see that if you introduce a, a, a treatment that you flatten this curve, and you can also see a dose response curve. So one thing is to, to show that there's an efficacy, but you know, in some, some trials, it may also be uh, used as, as, as a readout to determine what is the optimum dose uh, to go to move forward to phase three. Um, here's another uh, trial more recently from the Ocrelizumab uh, program, where uh, again in phase two it was shown that this had a very strong effect on, on gadolinium. And in this particular study, we drilled down and we looked at, at very early epochs of treatment. And you could see with, with gadolinium that even after uh, four weeks, which was the first scan after baseline, you already see a very strong uh, effect of, of the drug. And by, by week eight, it, it's uh, at, at floor level. So there's a massive suppression of, of new um, inflammatory uh, lesions very early on, uh, probably already happening within, within the first month. You can do the same thing by not giving gadolinium, but just looking at the number of new lesions on a T2 scan. Um, and, and then obviously after some time you will see the same effect, but you can see early on the effect is a little bit weaker because if, if you have a T2, you compare two T2 scans and you see new lesions, you don't know when they happened. So they could have happened one week after the previous scan or they could have happened just before the next scan. So you don't have the timing anymore, which you have with the gadolinium because you know the gadolinium is an acute short-lived phenomenon. Uh, but obviously, you cannot keep doing monthly gadolinium scans. So in bigger studies, especially in phase three, uh, 
uh, the, the scanning frequency will be lower, let's say six months or every 12 months, and then the added value of gadolinium over T2 diminishes significantly and it becomes more effective to do uh, look just at the T2. Uh, here's a um, study that we did based on the Tempsorolimus uh, study, which is a drug that in the end didn't make it, uh, but in, in fact had an effect on the development of new lesions, where there were monthly scans available with gadolinium and we knew the number of enhancing lesions. But then we said, let's do a study and look only at the T2 scan at baseline and month nine. So here's from the same subject, the baseline and the month nine, and you can see multiple new lesions. And if you subtract the two images, you can look in the subtraction domain and look at the new lesions that occur. So this is a nice visual aid, also helps improve the interreader uh, agreement a lot. And then uh, we looked at the number of lesions that we saw with the subtraction T2 versus the cumulative number of gadolinium lesions. So overall, the gadolinium is slightly more uh, sensitive in picking up new, more, more lesions. Um, but if you look at the power calculations, then in fact, you need smaller sample sizes if you use the, the number of new T2 lesions from subtraction imaging, just because there's less variability in the, in the readout. So even though you see slightly fewer lesions, um, your trial becomes more powerful. And obviously, you save a lot of, of scans. Well, all of this is um, uh, described in this paper, describing uh, how to use MRI to monitor immunomodulation in relapse onset uh, MS trials, if you're interested to, to read up about it. It's, it's a paper from some time ago, but I think most of these things still help ha uh, hold up and, and uh, still being used exactly the way uh, they were described then. So now let's look at the other end of the spectrum. And I already showed you this patient that we followed over 10 years and you could see the black holes and the atrophy development. Here's a patient who we that we scanned uh, who we scanned after uh, immediately after death. This was a Dutch patient who had um, signed up for the Dutch Brain Bank and donated their brains for research. And uh, you can see that um, there's a lot of atrophy and there's a lot of black holes. So this is the end stage of the disease and that's obviously what you would like to, to prevent. Uh, if you look at the rates of atrophy in a healthy population, of course, as we age, there is a bit of atrophy uh, developing, but it's much more an untreated MS. And what you really would like is these people to go into the normal aging bin. So you will never be able to keep the brain volume completely stable, but you would like the rate of atrophy to flatten and, 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 and come to the normal curve. So people have looked at brain volume changes over time. Uh, and if you look at, 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 at uh, this is from the UCSF data set where they looked at uh, stable patients, you can see that actually the brain volume, so this is now a fraction of the total intracranial volume, goes down uh, over time, but you can see that people who are uh, worsening um, have, have a steeper and a lower curve. So they have a lower brain volume to start off with, but also the rate of decline is stronger. What is scary though, if you look at the individual measurements, you see that there's enormous amount of measurement noise. And that's why, unfortunately, uh, we cannot use this in clinical practice because if people change scanner or change scanner protocol, you get a slightly different brain volume and it's too messy for, for individual patient monitoring. Unlike the gadolinium and T2 that we use every day to monitor treatment efficacy. Uh, brain atrophy cannot be done like this in clinical practice, but in trials you can, because there you can control the acquisition parameters, the scan parameters, make sure that it's always the same scan protocols or ask for a rescan. And you can use very sensitive registration-based atrophy measurements. So this is a technique where you have two scans, you register the two one another, and you just look at the very subtle differences that occur at the edges. And then you can look at the displacement, sum up the displacement over the whole volume and calculate the rate of atrophy. Uh, again, going back to the uh, Fingolimod phase three studies. Um, so I was involved uh, personally in the transfer, but alongside with the freedoms, which was placebo controlled. And you can see that uh, either in, in placebo or in patients with, with a comparator arm, there's significant atrophy occurring on the order of, let's say, 0.6% per year in, in, in controls, perhaps 05 under um, first line treatment. And you can see that you can reduce that uh, uh, quite a bit with treatment. And, 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 and actually, you, you would like it to be over here, probably to come into the normal range. So this is a, a partially uh, effective drug in terms of preserving brain volume. 
One thing that is um, difficult in this arena is that some drugs, for example, natalizumab, tend to sort of initially accelerate the brain volume loss. And if you then look longer, uh, the curve flattens. And, and this has been uh, alluded to as pseudoatrophy, uh, probably because there are some, some shifts. If you, if, so for example, if you take steroids, that will decrease your brain volume by 1% uh, in a couple of days, um, which is obviously not neurodegeneration, but just fluid shifts. And most likely with active uh, immunosuppressive drugs, you may have similar effects. Also with stem cell therapy, you see initial acceleration of brain volume loss and then a flattening of the, of the curve. It is a clinical meaningful uh, effect. If you look at the effects on brain atrophy and the effects on disability, you can see that overall, uh, the treatment effects are correlated and actually better correlated than with le uh, if you just look at lesions, although if you combine it, the prediction is better. So that it is a clinically meaningful uh, outcome and also the, the, the change in atrophy is clinically meaningful. And as I said, what is really important for MS is, is the, uh, the cervical cord. And here we can look at atrophy as well. Uh, and you can see that in progressive patients, there can be very significant reduction in, in, the, in the cord area. But you know, notice it's, it's a very small structure between let's say 60 and 100 square millimeters. So that's also between 60 and 100 pixels. So if you make five pixels mistake, you have a massive error. Uh, and again, here people have shown that this decreases over time more rapidly in patients with secondary than in relapsing remitting MS, but look at the variability. So also, uh, so even, even in a group with hundreds of patients, you cannot reach a statistical significance, even though you can see the trends happening. Uh, again, here we can use the registration techniques to register the two cords and to very subtly look at the change in the, in the contour of the tissue. And you can see that you can massively reduce the sample size by using these, uh, these registration-based techniques. And, and even with only 30% effect size, you would come into, um, let's say, achievable sample sizes for, for a clinical trial. And then uh, finally, we can look at the damage within lesion and the lesion evolution. And some lesions become uh, black holes, whereas other lesions that are active may sort of repair. So there's if you have a new lesion, the, you know, either it can completely repair or it can become a black hole with persistent damage. Uh, and I wanted to, show, to, to share this story with you. This is a um, PDE4 inhibitor study that I was involved with. I booted last and the company asked me to, uh, to design a phase two study with it and uh, was a properly designed study with about 100 subjects per arm. And you can see as in, in the previous examples, the placebo group did what it did, was very active, but then uh, the two doses were uh, completely ineffective in suppressing new lesions. But when we looked at the brain volume data, we saw something different. We saw, hey, strange, uh, there seemed to be a, a trend in the, in the brain volume data. Is that realistic? So we then looked at the development of, of black holes and also the proportion of black holes that developed was different. So apparently this drug is not an anti-inflammatory drug, but a neuroprotective drug. Um, reason why somebody then uh, took this to a phase three, did a bigger study in a primary progressive MS or progressive MS, sorry, and uh, showed that there was a clinical effect and also confirmed the brain atrophy effect. So just shows you how you can use MRI to also understand the, the disease mechanisms. So this recovery may be due to either neuroprotection or due to remyelination. So either it prevents demyelination to occur and preserves the axons, or damage occurs and it then stimulates remyelination, which we know happens naturally. Here's from, again, from our post-mortem work where we looked at some lesions, and this is a clear lesion on the T2, but under the microscope, most of the lesion, so this is completely demyelinated, perhaps a little bit darker on the T1, but the rest has a sort of myelin pallor, which the uh, uh, pathologist called this a shadow plaque. So this is partial, this is remyelination, and, and, and if it's remyelinated, you get a bit thinner myelin sheet, so it looks a bit less uh, clearly stained. And also at post-mortem, you can see that here's a shadow plaque with a rim of partial myelin, which is probably newly for myelin. And you can recognize on a T2-weighted image that it has a slightly different signal intensity. So to better understand this, you can use quantitative techniques, and there's lots of quantitative techniques, and 
uh, they all have their advantages and disadvantages uh, and, and, uh, and you can look then in lesions or in the normal appearing brain tissue. And some of them have uh, a high specificity for myelin and can be used to look at remyelination. And one of them is the so-called magnetization transfer ratio, the MTR, which requires two scans to be acquired and then you can calculate the map which is proportional to, to myelin density. Uh, we looked with this measure in, 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 a, in a, a trial, uh, it's an old study, uh, oral interference study, which was negative, but it was a good test case. So we could look at the evolution of the MTR in lesions. And you can see early on in lesions, it's, uh, there's uh, not much happening, but around the time of enhancement, there's a marked drop. And then you can see a recovery happening in lesions. So you can calculate the amount of recovery and take that as a readout of uh, um, repair or remyelination um, and we looked at sample size calculations and uh, also here you can achieve reasonable sample sizes um, depending on on the efficacy let's say uh, uh, 40 percent um, improvement in in the myelin density you c it is achievable but it depends on the number of lesions because you're looking at lesions so if there is no lesions there's nothing to be measured so that's a, a drawback of this uh, scenario and then finally, I want to mention the uh, chronic active lesions, also referred to as, as smoldering lesions. So gadolinium enhancement is one thing, but after the gadolinium is gone, there may still be ongoing activity in the rim of the lesions. And the pathologists actually, they think that almost half of the lesions are chronic active lesions. And they can see under the microscope, this cell infiltrates, and these cells contain iron, these macrophages, they contain iron. And iron we can see on susceptibility weighted imaging, uh, and they're called paramagnetic rim lesions or pearls, uh, which are nice to characterize patients, but they don't change very much over time. So they're not a very good outcome measure in clinical trials. The other thing to look at is slowly evolving lesions. And remember the black holes that we saw that were slowly growing. If you have multiple scans in one patient, you can very nicely register them and look at very subtle expansion over time, which is color coded over here, and then look at chronic activity in the sense of lesion enlargement uh, i won't go into the other markers because that's beyond the scope of, of this talk and here's from uh from the aqualuzumab studies where this first has been examined uh, so here's a t1 weighted image you can normalize the signal intensities and then you can look at the change of these normalized signal intensities and you can see that there's a rim of change occurring also you can see it in the subtraction image and then you can overlay this to show where the slowly expanding lesions are and over time, you can see that lesions tend to become uh, darker, but especially the cell lesions tend to become a lot of dark, lot darker. So these are lesions that are not only expanding, but also the center is getting more destructive inside. And this occurs more frequently in progressive patients than in relapsing patients, as you might ex uh, expect. So this readout, this readout is now being applied in trials. Here's one from a recent BTK inhibitor study, uh, where, which was very effective in reducing the number of enhancing lesions, but also in reducing the number of slowly expanding lesions. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the program has now been uh, discontinued because the phase three trial in the end uh, failed to show a clinically significant effect, probably because of the low relapse rate that is occurring in, in the current landscape. And as Lynn said, it's increasingly difficult to find informative and active patients in trials. And, and again, MRI can help you identify uh, such patients. So to sum up, um, I think the role of MRI in, in phase two trials is very well established to show that drugs have an anti-inflammatory uh, um, effect and, and frequent gadolinium uh, scans are very useful. Although with T2 subtraction, you can do it with much less effort. Um, and then in phase three, uh, you will need a, a clinically relevant outcome. Uh, obviously, brain atrophy becomes more important, uh, but you can also look in, in subgroups by with lesion activity, as I mentioned. And then uh, I, I discussed some emerging outcomes and uh, the chronic active lesions or smoldering lesions certainly attract attention and the cells are a good readout for that. Uh, remyelination is also a very uh, popular topic at the moment, uh, much more difficult to establish. Uh, and I showed you some opportunities using uh, lesional MTR. And with that, I think I'll close and give the word back to you, Janie.
Thank you, Frederick. That was really fascinating. Uh, and I think that we can see that there's a lot of really good opportunity that comes out from uh, just for, the fact that we know that uh, uh, what's established in phase, uh, phase two and what we're actually looking at in phase three is going to be very uh, beneficial in the long run. But also, yeah, I think there's lots of um, things to ask. Uh, I'm going to now invite Kersey and bring back Lynn uh, for the Q&A. Um, and so without further ado, um, if you have any questions for Frederick um, after his presentation, please pop them into the, uh, the chat box. Oh, no, the questions box, sorry. Um, and otherwise, Kirsty, I think we've got a couple of questions lined up. Um, fire away. It's all yours. Thank you, Tene. And thank you, Lynn. And thank you, Frederick. I think it was a very nice overview of the MS clinical trials and imaging. Um, yeah, there, there are some pre-submitted questions that I could ask you now. Um, so first of all, um, Frederick, you mentioned the chronic active lesions and smoldering MS. So um, do you have any opinion on um, if you want to monitor the chronic active lesions, whether it's more important to monitor the slowly expanding lesions or the paramagnetic rim lesions? Yeah, th thanks, Kirsty. And, and uh, so we've looked at that in various data sets, and uh, it's you know they're both readouts for chronic activity, um, but the, the cells are more frequent than than the pearls. And if you look at so some lesions are both a pearl and will become a cell over time, but also lesions that are a cell that are are not a pearl, and 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 conversely. But there are many more cells than than pearls, and and the pearls tend to remain relatively stable it's, it's almost like like a tattoo uh that you can't get rid of so if you have a ring lesion on the swi they're, they're likely to persist and some new lesions may maybe a cell as well in in the same patients but there are also many patients without uh pearls whereas many more patients will have cells and they're, they're much more dynamic and more numerous so as an outcome measure uh the cells are more attractive but, the, you, but you could use the pearls uh, for stratification because you know that the people with pearls, but also people with black holes are people that are more likely to have cells. So you can sort of pre-select uh, your trial population using that. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, maybe I could just follow up then with a, another question. Um, so in terms of the different forms of MS, do you think there are some main differences between the imaging requirements for relapsing and progressive MS? I'm thinking like the types of lesions and, and things like volumetric MRI and the, the new techniques as well, the advanced techniques. Um, yeah, I, th I think all the, pro all, all the relapsing forms of the disease are, are basically a continuum. And, and why people become progressive is it's not completely clear, but probably has to do with lesion location. So having a lot of infratentorial and spinal cord lesions, spinal cord atrophy, more black holes. So there's sort of uh, gradual differences between the two. Uh, primary progressive MS tends to have fewer lesions and a bit smaller lesions, but in the end they do develop new lesions. They do have, they may have less frequent gadolinium enhancement. So if you power for new lesions, you may have need uh, slightly more more um, subjects or longer periods of observation. So there are yeah, gradual differences, but they're not black and white. Okay, yeah. Um, and Lynn, um, you made some interesting points about um, recruitment and the challenges, like given the number of trials. Um, is there anything that you think the study sponsors should consider in particular um, to enhance recruitment? Yes, yeah, so there's a few things they can do. One is minimize the washout period. Um, 20 years ago, we were doing six months washout, then three months. Subjects really don't like that today. Um, keep it as short as you can. If you can have an active comparator, please do. Um, if you can have an open label study at the end of the trial, if you have sufficient safety and tox data, that's not always possible in a phase two study. And with Quintas, we did do a survey looking at what factors 
make patients go in a study and what puts them off a study. And for MS, due to the fatigue, if you have long visits, they don't like that at all. They would prefer to have more visits, more clinic visits, but shorter visits. So you can actually help your recruitment by just making a few tweaks to your protocol if you have sufficient data and if your drug-drug interaction studies will, you, will allow you to just minimize the washout time period and try and get it to one week or less. Not always possible with the drugs that we have today, which are given once a year or once every six months, but some of them may be able to reduce that washout time period. Yeah, thank you for that, Lynn. Um, now we have one question going back to the slowly expanding lesions. So the question is like, how sensitive is the iron accumulation as a biomarker on QSM, so quantitative susceptibility mapping images in the treatment of slowly expanding lesions, so the cells? And is, is QSM MRI the most useful technique to quantify iron dysregulation to track lesions and MS progression? Yeah, so QSM is a very sensitive technique, and it's good to realize that uh, if we see a rim or we see a dark signal on, on MR, uh, sometimes you need just a very tiny amount of iron to produce a, a magnetic field susceptibility, and, and QSM, as, as the name suggests, uh, the S stands for susceptibility mapping, is a technique that amplifies the sensitivity to uh, to this iron effect. So. It is very, very, uh, very sensitive to it. Uh, and uh, yeah, an advantage of QSM is that it's a sort of semi-quantitative technique, so you can quantify the signal intensity if you want, although the pearls, the uh, so the, the rim leashes that I described is, is a visual um, derivative thereof. And are there any disadvantages yeah, any other, then? Yeah, any other and the other question was, I guess, around uh, how prognostically relevant it is. So these these findings, bo both the cells and the pearls, are prognostically unfavorable. So you see more of them in patients with secondary progressive, and people who have them are more likely to accumulate more disability over time. So it's an unfavorable disease characteristics. And, and many drugs that we use are effective in suppressing uh, new lesion formation, and I think, you know, for example, natalizumab is a very good example. It, it blocks the uh, uh, cells from going across the brain barrier, but it doesn't really do much within the CNS. And also for other drugs, it's very difficult to establish how much drug gets into the CNS and then works within the CNS. Um, so obviously, um, some drugs may reduce the number of gadolinium lesions, but have a lesser effect on these chronic active lesions. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we have come to the end of the Q and A, and Jane is back, so I'll hand <laughs> over to Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty, Lynn, and Frederick. That was really insightful, and I think I hope that everybody understands here the opportunity that we have uh, for treatment of MS, and also understanding the disease progression as well through imaging biomarkers. Um, and there. I think that in the next uh, couple of years, we're definitely going to see a much bigger shift in, understand, in how we're going to a track and uh, treatment effects, but also what what the opportunities are for different therapeutic uh, therapies in line with the imaging biomarkers that Frederick has talked about. So, um, if you have any further questions, uh, please do reach out to us. Um, uh, hello at exco.com. Don't forget to follow us uh, on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, as mentioned before, this record, uh, webinar has been recorded and that it will be sent to you once it has uh, been concluded. You can also, uh, also send over a link so then that way you can forward it over to anybody that has missed uh, the webinar. Uh, and also please answer our survey at the end um, as your insight and feedback is going to be important for informing uh, Lynn and Frederick about the topics that are of interest to you specifically, but also for our future webinars as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We do uh, appreciate your time, uh, wherever you are and uh, whatever time it is. Have a good afternoon, good evening, and a uh, good morning. Thank you, folks. Take care.